The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Hello, everybody. This is Sophie from English Australia. Um, my apologies for the late start. The, our system had a bit of a crash, but we've got it back up and running now. And thank you all for sticking around and for attending. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. So if you can hear me, can you just type in yes? Okay, wonderful. I've got lots of yeses. Well, let's get started. I'd like to um, introduce today's presenter, Meredith McCauley, who's going to be talking about motivating EAP students, and she's very qualified to, te to talk about this. Meredith's been teaching English for more than 20 years, and she's an EAP teacher at UNSW Global in Sydney, and she's also a teacher trainer. Um, and she's a regular speaker at the English Australia Conference and contributor to the English Australia Journal, as well as um, a speaker at the UACA PD Fest and the Meet ELT events as well. So we're really lucky to have Meredith, and I'll pass over to her now. Okay, so um, hello everyone. So today I'm going to talk about um, motivation and EAP students and I think it's kind of um, a, a, a great time to talk about this because I know that uh, there are quite a few EAP students at the moment in Australia, lots of direct entry programs. Uh, so this is, um, yeah, a good time to, to discuss this. So what I'd like to do first of all, is it not Oh, sorry, I'm just having a bit of trouble with my slides. Just a moment. Oh, okay, so I'd like to show you a picture. So does this look familiar to anyone? If it does, you can say yes. Okay, so um, there, this is actually a staged photo, but the reason I put this photo here is just to get you to think about um, whether you've been in a class where sometimes students, you know, they don't seem engaged, maybe they don't seem so interested. So um, it can be maybe even demotivating for us. So what I'd like to do today is first of all, I'd like to talk about motivation uh, and a definition of motivation. So we're um, kind of all on the same page with what I'd like to talk about. And then how can... Um, how are EAP and motivation linked? So what are some factors that affect motivation in the EAP classroom? And then I'd like to um, go through five principles that I believe um, can motivate students, um, five principles, and then I'll give some um, example activities and perhaps we can do some activities together. So, oh, thank you. Oh. Okay. Okay. So first of all, what is motivation? Where's that? Okay. So the motivation is the reason for someone's behavior. And you've probably seen the, um, the concept of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So it's it, it, intrinsic motivation is motivation that comes from within. So, um, most of us probably are intrinsically motivated as teachers. You know, we enjoy teaching, we enjoy seeing our students learn, and you know, it's something that, that we like to do. However, um, it's probably unlikely that most of us would maybe put as much effort or spend as much time doing it if we didn't have a salary. So that, that would be extrinsic motivation when something from the outside is motivating us to, to act. And many of us probably, you know, have done further study, maybe we've done our masters, but, um, and we enjoy the course, but perhaps uh, we wouldn't maybe have done it if, you know, it wasn't going to help us with our career path or it wasn't expected. Um, and that's the same with our students. So um, can you just type in, does anyone have students who you believe are intrinsically motivated to do your EAP course? Okay, so there are, um, there's one person, um, just, oh, a few people, okay. A few. Okay. So um, many students, not many, okay, many students, um, well, I'd say the majority of the students actually are doing um, the EAP course as a pathway. So it's something they're doing to get into university. However, that doesn't mean that, you know, they can't enjoy the course and feel that it's something um, that's going to help them with, you know, their future. So when I look at motivation, Oops. This, oh, sorry. 
I'm having trouble with that. This one here? Okay, so the definition of motivation for this talk then. The roller, okay. Sorry guys, I'm having trouble with the, um, with the control. Okay, it's striving for competence and mastery with interest and, joy and enjoyment. So we want our students to, to try, we want them to um, achieve and pass our course and master the material, but we hope that they enjoy the course and are interested in what they're doing. Okay, so um, I'd first like to just ask you, uh, what are some issues related to motivation in the EAP classroom and why do some EAP students lack motivation? So if you just like to type uh, one or two comments um, to these questions. Okay, tired, they're always working, they're also working. Okay, the material can be incredibly dry. The study load, they find it much harder than they expected. Overload, lack of belief and ability, interesting. The proficiency level might be low. They don't understand, they think it's too hard. They, they didn't pay for the course personally. They like to stay with the same community, they're homesick. Family expectations. Okay. All right, so a lot of you, uh, highlighted some of the issues that I'd like to just briefly talk about. So uh, the first one I'd like to highlight is um, the course. So the content, um, in most of our EAP courses, um, the content is required. It's, the curriculum's quite prescriptive. And um, because of that, there's not a lot of time to, you know, address perhaps the individual needs or concerns of our class. We have a lot to get through. And as someone mentioned, students might find some of the material dry. Maybe the teacher's also, you know, not particularly interested. And this might be true, particularly if you're doing a general EAP course where you're looking um, not specifically at the major the students are going to do at university, but you're... Um, looking at something that's non-discipline specific. Another factor is time. So for example, in my course that I'm doing now, it's a direct entry program, it's 10 weeks. So there's a lot to cover in the 10 weeks and can be a bit of an overload for students and there's really no room um, to, to do extra material. Okay, so I just like to look at a few other factors. Why do some students lack motivation? Okay, so some students might see EAP course perceived as a hurdle. So um, we've mentioned that one already. Slow progress and long pathway. So some of our students are here for maybe 30 weeks. They may continue on and they don't see that they're actually progressing. And often they're not able to change the pathway in the middle unless they do, for example, an IELTS course. Some students, as you mentioned, may be sent to study in Australia, uh, maybe even sent to study a particular subject that they didn't choose themselves. Um, I don't know about you, but I think it's quite common. We maybe have monolingual classes. Um, a very, very large percentage where I teach um, are 97% maybe are Chinese. And so many students are not motivated to speak English in the class with students who speak their language. They may have a poor relationship with classmates and teachers, although I find this isn't that common. Uh, as someone mentioned, feeling the class is too difficult, low level of skills, uh, adapting to a different culture of learning. Um, I was speaking to another teacher about this the other day. Uh, some students may have been successful in English in the past and successful in their studies by using different strategies than they're able to use now. Um, so adapting to this culture of learning it can be difficult finding they're not successful with the same strategies um, and living in a new place. Okay, so I'm gonna go through five principles of motivation. When I planned this talk, I've done this talk at uh, UECA, uh, I, I brainstormed some principles that I um, think are important to motivate um, EAP students. And I also looked at some theories. I looked at self-determination theory and the ARCS model of motivational design. And I came up with this acronym CHARM. So um, we'll have a look at this and see, maybe we can, 
charm our students but, and help them uh, motivate themselves as well. So as we're going through, if you want to try to guess the, um, the principle with the letter. So I'm going to start with R. And the first one is build and maintain rapport. And the reason I chose um, this picture is because for me, our students are kind of like flowers, I guess. Um, and if they don't get the, you know, they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel nurtured in class, they might wilt, for example. And um, research shows that rapport is, is a factor of motivation and a um, one study by Ryan and Wilson on university students actually showed that rapport can increase student motivation and even predict the final grade of students. And here are some things that I do to establish rapport from the start. And I'm sure um, a lot of teachers just maybe in the past week have gotten new classes and done some activities like these. The first one I like to do is to collect information from students on the first day. Um, the reason I like this kind of um, grid is because students can not only write down, you know, their, about their study, but they can also write something about their interests, their personality. And what I like to do with this is look at it maybe after two weeks, after four weeks, after six weeks, and see, is there something I can say to the student um, and ask them about to continue, you know, establishing that rapport. Because I find when we're teaching EAP, sometimes we're so focused on the material, helping students to pass, you know, get through the course, attending to their study needs that we, we forget about this rapport and forget about their interests in class. Another thing um, that I do on the first day of class is to find someone who, and some people think maybe this is very general English, but the reason I like to do this is because it can really um, create group cohesion on the first day. And it's also a really good way for students to um, relax, find out what they have in common with other new students in the class. Um, and this is basically for new students who've just come, not continuing classes. and. Um, also, um, it's a good thing that I like to do when students are coming in um, late, perhaps. So, you know, it's just a relaxing atmosphere. Okay, so continuing to build rapport. Um, at my school, I'm really lucky we have Moodle, so we use the discussion board quite a lot. And um, often after a reading or after listening, um, I type a question to the students and then they can answer and comment on each other's. Um, on each other's writing. So it's quite um, quite nice to develop rapport with the students themselves, but also, um, yeah, with me as well to find out about their interests. Okay. Here's some other ideas for building and maintaining rapport. So group work, mixing up groups. So um, we don't have clicks in the class, so people can, so students can all um, enjoy the, you know, the different personalities, the different strengths, the different accents of the other students. Team tasks, one-to-one -one consultations. Um, I'm really lucky to work at a school where we do have one-to-one -one consultations um, every week with the students, so we can get to know them, get to know um, if they have, you know, any questions. Um, how they're progressing, drawing on students' expertise, sometimes in a discussion class. Um, the first few minutes, we have students do like a one-minute impromptu talk about something that they're able to do, something they're interested in. Uh, class routines. Um, some teachers at my school um, have a routine. One thing that I was doing one five-week term is uh, to do proverbs. So I would write half of the proverb on the board where there's a will, there's a, and they had to complete with way. Um, and we, every day we learned a different proverb and talked about how it applied, you know, to their studies, to their time in Australia. And then they came up with their own proverbs. They quite enjoyed that. Um, I'd like also to talk about um, building and maintaining rapport um, building rapport, I guess, with the community. So adjusting to surroundings. Uh, some teachers do weekend challenges um, and challenging students to get out and get to know Sydney. So um, 
this is one thing that my colleague James Heath and Matt Turpak have done. It's called the Selfie Safari. So they challenge the students to go out and take a photo of themselves in different places in Sydney. And it's quite motivating. The students um, get to know each other. They do it in groups, but they also get to know the community. Then they come back and do presentation. Um, if you're doing a course where you don't have time for that extra presentation, you can just have them post their photos on Moodle, maybe do a quick 10 minute warmer at the beginning of class. Okay, so um, we talked about rapport, which was um, the R, and now I'd like to talk about the C. And I put this um, photo from one of my favorite movies, The Karate Kid, up because I think it um, really shows something interesting that sometimes happens in instruction. We've got um, Daniel here, and he really doesn't know why he's doing this activity. Uh, Mr. Miyagi obviously has a plan. He's trying to, um, you know, build his uh, strength to do some karate moves. But Daniel just wonders, why am I doing this? So the next um, principle is making connections. And research shows that when students perceive that an activity is relevant, then they will be more motivated. And I think this also links to transfer, which I'm very interested in. Um, our course is preparing students for university. So if they see that what we do in class is relevant, it's going to help them in the future, they will be more motivated and more willing to, you know, to participate in, to put forth their effort in the activity. Okay, so how can we establish relevance? So for the first thing is to make it relevant. Um, the content activities and most of our courses probably if you're especially if you're um, at a university English center um, there's probably been a lot of research done into your curriculum so that the curriculum does simulate the types of activities that are done at uni um, and if you're interested there's a really nice paper um, by James teaching for transfer and it talks about all kinds of hugging and bridging techniques we can use in the classroom um, to make the context in our EAP courses similar to, um, to the university, to the target context. So once we've got the relevance, um, here are four steps that we can use. So first of all, linking to previous experience. So this is, I guess, kind of like activating schema. So what do students already know that they can build on? Um, in a class, so students feel they have some sorts of continuity in, in what they're doing. So I like to try to draw parallels between the previous class and the next one or skills they've already learned. So for example, students might give a verbal summary and then they'll do a written summary. And it's the same, you know, similar activity, different form. Um, also in the discussion class, um, I try to draw, draw parallels between the types of discussion they do in their discussion class, the tutorials, and the type of discussion they're leading in their presentation class. Um, I think that perceived present worth and perceived future usefulness go together. As we said, um, or as I said before, um, our well, at least my EAP, it simulates the types of things they might do at uni. So a lot of the tasks are going towards the assessment. So something they might learn today, for example, um, learning how to um, search for sources for their um, for their research that will be relevant to, for example, their presentation that, they, that they're doing research for. Um, referencing will also be useful for that assessment as well. Uh, so one thing that we can do in our class is really make the aims of the activities very explicit so they know why they're doing it and perhaps how it will help them for the next activity. But looking further on, perceived future usefulness, um, students can anticipate applications. So for example, um, we have collected data from our students, um, our graduates, about the types of tasks they've done. So one thing I like to do is show that information, for example, about presentations, and show that perhaps, uh, I think it's 75% of our students in their first semester do a presentation. So that's why they're giving a presentation in our EAP course. Um, and so they know that it's a useful activity. Um, and I'll, I'll show you another example in a moment. Uh, presenting models of success. So 
basically that's showing that the types of tasks we're giving our students can be done and students can succeed in them. So we can be a model of success. For example, when students are, um, we have a, uh, sorry, a listening lecture class. And so students are taking notes. So sometimes what I do is I take notes at the same time and I project my notes on the um, data projector to show students that even though, you know, I'm a teacher, it doesn't mean I wrote down everything. So I can show them that, you know, it can be done. And I'd like to show you another model of success. Um, this is, um, Cassie, and she's a former UEC student, that's my EAP course, and she's talking to the current UEC students about her experience at university. So this is a good example of um, anticipating applications. She's talking about the kinds of assignments she has, and she's giving students advice. So I think it motivates the students just to, to see that, oh, this is where I'm going, this is my pathway, and it's also a model of success. Another example I have here is um, looking at a, um, a course outline at university. So one thing that you could do if you are able to get a course outline is to have students look at the type of assessment they have to do and to see, hmm, is what I'm learning relevant? Can I uh, apply any of these skills? And when I've shown this to my students after about nine weeks of the course, they can see that, oh yeah, um, I've done reflective writing in my course. Um, I do consultation regularly. Um, I also have given a presentation. And I think the peer assessment for this particular assessment is interesting because we do a lot of peer work and we also do peer feedback. And that's actually part of their score. So this is um, a good activity to, to get students to see, you know, to make it real that they're going to university to, and see that, you know, what we're doing is relevant and they're learning, probably learning very useful skills. Okay. So now we're gonna move on to the next principle, which is to mix things up. I mentioned before um, that often EAP courses seem very you know, prescriptive. We have a lot of information to get through, a lot of useful information, but if we do things the same every day, we can get bored. Students get bored, we get bored, and you know we've known this from maybe classes we've taken in the past. So, we can still cover the content, but just change things around, um, create an element maybe of surprise um, and, and change things. So what I like to do are warmers. And for me, I think that there's really only about, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of time that you can do in an EAP course to insert a warmer. And I'm just going to show you one warmer that I like to do. I think the key with EAP warmers is, well, maybe the any warmers, to make it relevant so students can see, oh, you know, that was worthwhile. I'm do doing this activity for a purpose. Um, and you've probably done backs to the board, but when I do backs to the board with an EAP class, I do it in a modified way. So instead of two students sitting at the front and the whole class doing it. I have students do it in pairs. So if you look at the girl um, with A above her head, she would be looking at the board. She would be looking at a list of words. The girl um, with B over her head, she's not looking at the board. She's um, listening to the clues and trying to guess. And I do this particular activity often um, after students have done a reading on a particular topic and they need to do writing. So in a way, it's a brainstorming and helping students to think about vocabulary that they saw in the reading and connect it to, to the ideas in the text, so revising the text. And then they can use the same vocabulary uh, in their writing. And we also talk after they finish the activity, we look at uh, word form. So I'm just gonna model this with, with Sophie just so you can see what we're talking about. So as I said, this topic um, is energy. And I'm just gonna describe a couple words to Sophie and she's going to try to guess them. Okay, you ready? Okay, so um, Sophie, this uh, word describes uh, the type of energy that doesn't run out. So not fossil fuels, but something maybe like solar energy. Renewable energy. Oh, well done. Okay, uh, the next one is, um, okay, so fossil fuels will run out, so they will become... Extinct. 
No. Um, okay. It's a word for energy. So it starts with a D. It will become... Depleted. Oh, well done. What's the noun? Mm, depletion. Well done. Okay, last one. Um, power that comes from the sun. Solar energy. <laughs> well done. Okay, so, um, and this is the list we were working from. And students quite like this activity. Um, and it gives... It, they're working by themselves, so they're working at their own pace. If they finish early, then they can talk about the relevance of the words. Okay, so we talked about warmers. Some other ways to mix it up is to use technology. So um, Kahoot, Quizlet, Socrative, Padlet. A lot of teachers at my school use these. I like to use, um, so occasionally I use Socrative, and the way I use it is um, I use the open answer function and I have students all um, log in as students and I give them um, a sentence to paraphrase and in pairs they write the paraphrase um, into the open answer um, square and then of if you know Socrative you'll know that all of the answers will then show up then we analyze the different paraphrases as a as a group and see you know do we need to adjust any of the language. Another thing I've done with Socrative is I've given pairs of students a the first page of a journal and I've asked them to write the citation as if they were going to do a reference list. And that was quite interesting. I gave, um, I think I gave three different um, pages of the journals and they all had different references. And we worked with kind of the tricky tricky things like first name, last name, the name of the journal, how to find those things on the first page. So that was that was quite fun. Um, and they enjoyed that. And it was a warmer. Um, we spent about 15 minutes on it. Okay, using movement. So rather than, you know, sitting down and discussing, they could just, students could stand up. And I'll show you an example of that. Student generated content and adapting the task. So I'm just going to talk about how we can adapt the task. So if you have a set of pre-reading or post-reading questions, um, you could use die is one thing. So rather than saying, okay, let's do task one, um, discuss the questions in task one out of the book, what you could do is you could just write the questions on the board or have them projected um, one to six. If you don't have six, add a few questions and they can roll the die and, um, and discuss them, discuss the number they roll. You could also um, have them stand up and talk, uh, discuss the questions. Um, after about a minute or so, they can switch partners. Some people like to do this in a speed dating format. Dictation. So what you could do for this one is, uh, so student, don't have students look at the book, but um, give each student at a table a number. So for example, one, two, three, four. Uh, when you say the number, read the question, and the student only writes the question that correlates with their number. So if Sophie was one, she'd write down question one. If I were two, I'd write down question two. And then each student is the expert on their question. And, then, you know, it's just a, a, just a way to, to make something different that day, but it's the same content. Okay, I've got um, a task here that you might find in a book. Have a quick look at this activity. So the purpose is to review the features of um, academic language. What might you do with this? So rather than just having students read it out of their book, what might be something you could do to um, review the academic language? I'll just give you a minute if anyone has an idea. I'm going too slow. Okay. Okay. So this is what I did. So I used an interactive mind map. So the I, the um, the objective was to have students revise academic style. So my students are um, had already been in the class for five weeks, so they were already familiar with with this. But I think even new students would have some ideas. So what I did. Um, was I put an A3 piece of paper on each desk. So there were four, um, or each table, there were four different tables. I gave every student a pen and I had them all draw the circle in the middle academic style. And then they just all started writing their own ideas, the branch and making the branches. 
uh, brainstorming what they already knew. And then after th about three or four minutes, I had two students from each table um, walk around to different tables. And then I had some students stay. So like the travelers were the ones that walked around and the settlers were the ones that stayed at their tables. Um, and they spoke to the new people that came and they added some information. And so this really covered the same objective, but it was just a variation and the students um, created something and then we put them on the wall. And then they can still read um, the text at the end and compare their answers. Uh, they could also take them home and, and have a look. Okay, so the next uh, principle is autonomy. So the A. Okay, so autonomy refers to giving students choice and decision making over their learning. And motivation theory links autonomy and motivation. And we also know that our students will have to be autonomous when they go to university. They, they, won't only have a choice, they will be obliged to to make their own decisions over their learning. Um, sometimes it seems, well, sorry, what I wanted to say, first of all, is that in our courses, we already probably have embedded independent tasks where which and we're scaffolding students towards learner autonomy. So for example, in my class, something I can think of that students do are individual presentations. So we we scaffold and teach students how to research, um, how to select academic material, then they go and choose their own articles and they uh, plan and organize and a presentation and then do that individual 20 minute presentation towards the end of the course. And so that's a, a very autonomous task, but we do scaffold it. But one thing that I was thinking though, is that because we've got such a, um, sometimes we have such a prescriptive course in EAP, there isn't a lot of scope for other autonomous activities. So let's just have a look at some situations here. Which situation allows for more student autonomy? So you can either type in what you think or just think, um, maybe jot it down on paper or just think in your head. So for set one, which would be the most autonomous, would you say? Okay, so B would be the answer. So students bring in a graph on topic of their interest. Okay, set two. Okay, so B again is the most autonomous um, choice, allowing more student autonomy and set three. Okay, so set three I think is a tricky one. Some teachers, especially um, students who have, sorry, teachers who have teenagers, um, sometimes they do ban the use of phones because students are, you know, tempted to go on them and do things other than perhaps using them for for academic reasons. But um, the most autonomous would be A, of course. Whoops. And um, none of these answers are really wrong. All, but all of them do have a different degree of autonomy. If we look at this Klein of Control from Alexander Arjun Spencer, this is a, a great book, Essential EAP. Um, students control, on the left side, you can see that students are controlling and student controls at the end. So that's really where we're moving. But all of these activities, um, you know, do take some scaffolding. So what we might do in the first instance, if we look back, Students could practice describing graph first and then bring in their own graph after that. So I think the idea is that the area of teacher control shrinks. We need to be flexible and responsive to our students, and but gradually hand over more control. And I think that can be really challenging because a lot of students are not used to, to having control. They're, maybe their culture of learning, they weren't, they weren't given that. So sometimes when you know, you ask students to peer review their students' paper, they'll, you know, they're kind of hesitant to do that. But if we scaffold that and teach skills and maybe show why it's important to be able to peer review their, you know, their partner's paper or um, to review their own paper, then then I think they would, 
they're more motivated to do that and they make that more of a habit. So here's a list of things that students um, that you can do within the scope of a class without changing the, the course, but just something that you can add. So encouraging student preparation and independent inquiry. So one thing some teachers do at my institute is to have students research the topic of the week. So we have thematic um, we have thematic units. So for example, energy. So students can um, research or find articles or listenings on energy and bring them into class and do like a jigsaw so they can tell each other about what they found. Um, one thing, another thing that I've seen people do is um, with water, maybe they could go and find an issue with water, take a picture of, of it on their phone. Maybe water is not a good example, maybe design. They could go um, around Sydney and take a, um, an example of design and then talk about that with um, their classmates. Um, involve students in task design. They could write comprehension questions, uh, discussion questions on Moodle, for example, about a listening. They could ask a question. Peer teaching, um, student-led activities. So we have writing workshops once a week. So what students can do is you can give them some writing to look at it and they can, um, in groups, they can present um, and evaluate different students' writing and talk about, you know, what was good about the writing and critique it. Um, and also encouraging reflection. Okay, uh, the last principle is to highlight progress. Okay, so drawing from the ARCS principle of motivation, um, a feeling of satisfaction with your progress motivates us to continue and to build confidence. So if students know, you know, they, they are progressing, then yeah, they put more effort into it and um, yeah, personally invest more. So here are some ideas with highlighting progress. So summative and formative assessment. And I think probably all of us have this embedded into our course. Uh, Self-reflection, so what's working, what would you like to do differently, what questions do you have? So even after, for example, um, a summative assessment, we have the presentations. Uh, what I have students do is just write down on a post-it, um, how did they feel after they gave the presentation, what might they do differently, um, how could they have prepared differently or more, uh, what questions do they have. Um, we obviously can't give feedback after the individual presentations until everyone has presented, but if students make it a habit to reflect after they've completed a task, I think, um, you know, they take more, they invest more into it and they they can see how much they've accomplished and, and plan for, for the future. Um, setting learning goals, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but helping students to set learning goals, but then checking to see whether they have actually achieved them. Um, portfolios, we don't have portfolios at in my um, course, but what we do have regular writing. So what you could do is have students um, keep their writings and then after maybe six weeks, go back to some of the earlier writings and reflect on them. So they could talk about, you know, how they improved or they could, another thing they could do is they could film themselves at the beginning of the class um, and then after several weeks, film themselves again, maybe doing the same task, a speaking task and, and reflect on how, you know, how far have they come? How do they feel about their progress? Um, peer feedback. So, um, students are highlighting um, other students' progress. Um, maybe instead of just always, everyone, I'm sure everyone does this, but instead of correcting the errors, pointing out, you know, five maybe um, examples of high-level vocabulary, something they like about the writing. Um, consultations, as I said, we do in my course. And um, you can ask students, you know, how, how instead of, what do you need to improve? You know, what have you improved? How do you feel about it? Um, and feedback, recognition, and praise is always really good. And here's an example of something that many students at my institute do. So um, goal setting. So pointing out the SMART goals, first of all, and explaining um, how you can set a measurable goal, a specific goal, 
attainable, relevant, and time bound. And what students do in the model, if you can look on the right, students write um, their weekly goals on a post-it note, and then they put the uh, post-it note on the on a piece of paper at the back of the room. And then after a week, they um, come back and take it off and discuss it with their partner. Did they achieve the goals? Why did they not achieve the goals? And students, um, they quite enjoy this. I think this is something that you really need to scaffold and, and talk about, are the goals actually achievable? Are they specific enough? So if a student just writes, improve my listening, you need to then guide them to, to say, well, how are you going to improve your listening? What are two, you know, what are some sources you're going to listen to? How are you going to check that you understood? And that kind of thing. Um, this is just another idea I've seen. If you're doing the other post-it note activity, this might be too much, but what stuck with you this week? So um, students could just post up something that they learned or something they felt that they have achieved this week. Um, also, I like exit slips sometimes. Um, if you do a lesson, um, I did something on referencing and afterwards I had students write something they felt that they learned, how they thought they'd um, use the uh, information and then did they have any questions and they wrote it on a post-it note as they were leaving and that was yeah they quite enjoyed that and um, learning journals as well we have learning journals on Moodle for um, for some of our courses um, over longer weeks okay so those are the prin the five principles so they're nothing new but I hope that you did get some activities and um, you know think about these principles so make connections was the first one, highlight growth, promote autonomy, build rapport, and mix it up. Okay, and just one last thing um, I wanted to say is, of course, stay motivated yourself. I mean, if you, especially if you're teaching the same course over and over, maybe um, I always try to try something new because it does, you know, re-energize you. Um, ask for feedback from students. I I do this uh, on occasion and ask students, you know, what is there an activity you particularly like, just something you want more of in class. Um, reflect on your lessons. I've been I've been trying to do this. I don't always remember. And talk to people. So talk to your colleagues. I get so many um, nice ideas from my colleagues. I've been working with the material the same material for quite a, a long time in this course, but then I, if I find that other people are, you know, putting a slightly different spin on the, you know, on different content or different lessons. So that's really nice um, to do. Um, Aussie LT, I really um, have enjoyed being part of that community. You can get lots of really great ideas. Um, I've recently discovered um, teaching and learning in EAP. This is a Facebook group that you can join. Um, and the um, participants of this uh, group are from all all over um, Canada, England, um, New Zealand, I think. So you can get lots of good ideas. Um, I mentioned UECA in the last webinar I did, but um, if you haven't been to UECA conference, they're really amazing um, because all many of the teachers, if not the majority, are EAP teachers. So you can get a lot of um, great ideas. And finally, here's my reference list. And if you get James, a uh, teaching for transfer in ELT, um, this has the hugging and bridging model. Um, some other sources, communicative activities for EAP is a fantastic resource. Maybe the best resource I've seen for EAP, for EAP in terms of doing activities um, by Jenny Goose. You may not have time to do to put a lot of them into your curriculum if you do have quite a full curriculum, but you can get a lot of ideas or different ways to kind of spin the content in your class. Um, Energizing EAP, this is something that, just a mini book that I self-published and it has some warmers, some of them that I've mentioned today. And the last one is English Teacher to Learner Coach. And this has a lot of um, ideas to get students to, to stay motivated themselves. So, um, so you're actually coaching your students to get them to do, you know, a lot of activities outside of class. 
and that's it. So thank you very much. And this is a, these are the same students before and they're doing this uh, modified Bex to the board. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, and I'm wondering, does anyone have any questions? Oh. What, sorry? Oh, okay. Oh, great. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, so one person asked me to put the slide um, with the books up, and I'll just do that now. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. I'm having a little bit of trouble with the computer mouse. I'm not used to this mouse. Whoops. There it is. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. I have some nice comments. Does anyone have any questions? Do you want to say anything? <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Um, this is a great question. Um, they speak Chinese, Chinese all the time. How do you stop them? Okay, this is from Susan. Thanks, Susan. Um, this is a really good question. <laughs> um, it is very difficult to stop my Chinese students from, yeah, from speaking their own language. Um, it's something that you can't stop. I, I can sometimes stop it during um, class. They do speak Chinese during the break. But what I do at the beginning is we just talk about the fact they're going to uni, um, they're here for two hours, uh, just kind of trying to jolly them around. And um, sometimes I try, I, I say, okay, let's challenge ourselves to, um, to speak English for two hours. Can we do it? And um, yeah, I think it's, it's just kind of a battle, but it's something I try to establish at the beginning and just explain that at uni, um, yeah, they're going to need to speak English. Um, and yeah, that, that it make, I guess it makes a good impression as well if they're speaking English at uni. If anyone else has ideas about that, about stopping, you know, students from speaking their own language, that would be great. Yep. Another one, would it be possible to send the reference list? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, should they even stop them? Oh, should I even stop them? Um, I prefer my students not to speak Chinese the whole time. I mean, obviously, if they say a few things, if they're just explaining something, um, but I, I do try to, ha personally, I try to have, um, you know, an English speaking classroom because they're there to learn English. Um, but occasionally, if they explain something in Chinese, I think that's fine. My students generally do speak English. I think also if we ask, I try to ask them, you know, can you, you know, challenge them to do it? That they usually do. Um, okay, we integrate speaking English into their independent learning assessment. Okay, so I guess that's for a grade. We also have a participation grade, but yeah, I suppose if you let students know that that's part of their um, assessment, that would work really well. Get them to reflect on their class language use too. Okay. Yeah, so maybe how much English did you use this week? Rate yourself four out of five. Oh, someone said that they have their their students for four hours. I have my students for four hours a day as well, but um, two two-hour um, sessions. So this is Sophie again. I'd just like to thank Meredith. Um, so you took us through all the really fundamental principles of um, motivation, which is great. It's always good to remember them. Um, and as well as that, gave us a lot of your very creative ideas. So thank you for sharing them with us. And um, everyone has said thanks in the comments. So thank you everyone for being so enthusiastic as well. Some people asked if we could share the references. Um, the slides and actually the recording of this webinar will be available on the English Australia website um, from Monday next week. And when you get a follow up email, I'll send you the link to the page on the website where it'll be available. So thank you to everyone. And I'll just put Meredith back on to say goodbye. 
Okay, thank you so much um, for your nice comments and thank you for, for attending. And um, yeah, I hope maybe I'll see you at a UECA conference or on RCLT. So thank you everyone and I hope you have a nice day. Thanks.